start recording just in case people who come in later, um, you know, uh, miss the first bit. So I am Professor Rosen. I am the I am the instructor for 2168. Um, so I teach two courses at Temple University these days. I teach, sorry, I teach three. Um, I teach a, I teach CIS 1051, which is the intro to computer science class in Python. And I teach 2168. I'm the course coordinator for both. So that means I help the, uh, help decide what content it is, is in both those courses. Um, and I also teach a graduate version of this course uh, in 5016. Um, so there are a number of graduate students who are on the Discord already who have actually done some of the assignments you are going to do. Um, so they, they can be, th that can be a resource available to you. Um, so a couple things to talk about first. Uh, first off, you made it to the course. So congratulations, you found the, the place and the time. Um, let me go ahead and uh, share my screen and get to the uh, and put us out on the on the uh, canvas page. Let's see, yep, no need to have Facebook open right now. Okay. So welcome to the course. Let's go ahead and edit that. It says spring. That's obviously not correct because I haven't really, altered this, I can type, I swear, summer two, there we go, save. I have essentially imported all the content from last semester because why not? And what we're going to, and I still have to adjust some of the due dates, but it's okay. So what is data structures? We are going to learn about how data is organized in order to solve problems. Uh, computer science, your curriculum is basically split up into three parts if you're going for a CS degree. The first part is learning how data, how basically to translate um, problems into, you know, how to take a look at a problem seriously and break it down into parts, and then how to translate those solutions to problems into uh, unambiguous statements that can solve these problems. That's your intro to programming. That's um, creating the basically how do you you know, create programs. Second part is, uh, we is that problems a lot of time have a lot of data. How do I organize this data? Because some, a lot of times, if I can just simply organize this data, I can solve this problem. That's data structures, um, which is so. How do we organize these? Uh, you know, the the data that we need to solve these problems. Um. And the third class is data structures and algorithms, which says, what if just simply, you know, now if we have these, the, these data structures, uh, what if just, you know, storing it in a data structure isn't enough? What do I need to do to actually solve some problems? How do things really work under the hood? That's um, something that Professor Hughes does in the next class. I think it's uh, 3223 for, um, so, uh, but this class is pretty important. It's also one of the classes that, uh, that companies like Google and Facebook and other big companies will draw from for interviews and interview questions. Um, so once you are done with this course, you should actually, believe it or not, be prepared to go and start doing interviews for internships. I would actually highly recommend that you do apply for interviews to interview at large companies for those internships. Um, if for no other reason, then you can learn what the interview process is like. Okay, you, so, even if you, so even if you don't, you know, uh, get in, you get this idea of how you can improve what needs to be done, what those companies are looking for. But this is one of those things, this is one of those courses that we can take a look at. Um, so let me, with that, let me go ahead and open up our syllabus. Um, also, again, please note that I am going to be uh, modifying the due dates 
for our assignments. Um, so first and foremost, the most important part of this class, right, that you should know is that our lectures are flipped for the most part. Um, now that means you will be watching a bunch of pre-recorded lectures that I have created outside of class. Um, now that sounds like it's going to be a drag and a lot of work. Well, turns out that because we, so the, he, there's a lot of rationale for this and it works for this class, specifically during the summer. It works even better if I'm, if, uh, when I'm, when I've got like a three hour block in, you know, where you have a once a week lecture, um, and then a lab, but it also works really well in this kind of situation where we're meeting very frequently for long periods of time. Um, because the idea here is, is that the idea behind a flipped lecture is that the time you typically are in class is the time when a lecture is actually the least useful for you because that's typically your first contact with the material. The professor is talking about the material and you might have some questions and you're like, okay, I understand this, I can do this. And then you sit down to the homework and you have no idea what to do. Um, and that's the time when being close to the professor to ask them a question would be more useful. So the idea here is that our lecture time, so this 8.30 to 12.45 block on Tuesday and Thursday, and this 8.30 to 10.30 on, on Mondays is time that you are going to spend working on most on your homework. My objective here is that the vast majority of your, uh, is that you should, is that the vast majority of the work should be done in class. You shouldn't have to do too much work outside of class, okay? Um, and then what you do outside of class is that you watch these lectures. Now, our first lectures, um, what would typically be the first week is review of stuff from 1068. So review of object-oriented programming. So stuff to get you back up to speed, to understand how my, how my demo process works and just a fun introduction into the class. So it's review stuff. So you can watch the lectures if you need to review, but otherwise uh, you can start with uh, the second week, which is half review and half new stuff. It's a ray list, but I go into way more detail than Professor Fiore prop, um, probably did because I talk about how we use generics and how array lists actually work under the hood. All right. So does everybody, any questions about the flipped, the flipped nature of the class? Um, and I will show you where to find those videos. It's pretty easy. Okay. So um, technology requirements, this is, I just copy pasted this essentially um, and added some other stuff. So, um, just, you know, make sure you can actually communicate with me and that you have an internet connection that actually works. Uh, your textbook is going to be Data Structures and Abstraction using uh, Java 3rd Edition uh, by two former professors who worked here. It's a good book. I use all, I cover all the chapters in the book except for nine. Um, and again, the only reason I don't do that is because there's just not enough time to get hit, to hit chapter nine. Now, um, previous, now I understand like restrictions about buying the textbook and stuff like that and people don't like buying it. So let me tell you what the difference between the second and the third edition is. Uh, the, sec the third edition added instructions on how to use uh, functional programming in Java. So how to do some uh, Lambda statements and the like in Java. And that's specifically in the binary search trees uh, book where they uh, show that how to use that for certain stuff. And that's useful information. It's pretty cool. But if you have the second, but if you happen to have had the second edition of the textbook, perfectly fine. Um, so just keep that in mind. It's useful. It's useful as a reference, especially if you feel like you need more than what I'm giving you in in class, um, but um, I, I am technic, you know, it, it 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 is useful to have. Um, office hours because of the summer semester, uh, it will be by appointment. So just shoot me a message on Discord or via email, and I'll show you that link to Discord in a bit. 
and you will be able to, uh, you know, we'll schedule some time to meet up uh, so that I can help you if you need help outside of class or something. All right. Expectations, attendance, you're supposed to be able to be here and be present for the class. I understand it, though, if you get sick or if something happens or real life happens, just shoot me an email when you can and let me know what's up. Right. Um, so just, you know, so long as you're honest and straightforward with me, I'll basically, you know, I, I won't be a jerk about it. <laughs> that's that's general, you know, I, I will be as as straightforward and as and um, helpful as I can be. All right. Um, if you are in a different time zone that is going to impact your ability to participate, please let me know so that I can help so that at least I can know about that. I've had, you know, so that when we're, uh, I can be aware, oh, right, this student, you know, if I'm going to schedule office hours, I have to be aware of this time. Um, if you have an issue with mental health, super stress, worried, um, whether because of this course or other factors, I, I hope not this course, but, um, but it, if anything happens like that's if negatively affects you and your performance in the class, please let me know because the sooner you let me know that you're having issues that, uh, that are affecting your ability to perform in this class, the sooner we can address it and the sooner we can, uh, make accommodations and the sooner I can point you towards any kind of any kind of help you need, such as okay, maybe you need uh, to contact uh, disability resources. Maybe you need to um, maybe you we need to work out a uh, different schedule and different deadlines. You know, so just let me know if you have a DRS accommodation. Again, please let me know. Um. All right. So I will be recording these lectures and I will be posting them on YouTube because that because YouTube is basically available on every single platform and I it's guaranteed to work very easily on people's phones and any device. So that is why I use it. Um, if you happen to make your own recording, sure, but um, you got to let me know, especially since Pennsylvania is a two party consent state, which means you, that everybody who's uh, in the recording, got to kind of know about it. All right, grading is roughly as follows. Uh, quizzes are about 10%. What the heck is a quiz? Quizzes are very short uh, self-assessments. I often allow you to take them multiple times. So there's no reason not to get 100 on these. Um, you know, these are, these are basically multiple times. I think the only penalty I have is I lock you out for 15 minutes um, between attempts. So, but these are basically, you know, self-assessments, basically checking with yourself. Did I understand the material? It also lets me know that you are keeping up with the material. That's the kind of the, the purpose of the quizzes. Labs and assignments. That is the big bulk of the course. Labs and assignments are basically the same thing, um, which are basically the, in a normal semester, these would be the weekly assignments, okay? Um, that we'd be going through. And we'll be going through maybe two a week over here. Um, then we'll have exams throughout the course. Um, typically, first exam, second exam, and then our final exam, each worth a respected amount. Um, I will discuss those as we get closer. But in general, um, those are open. Those are open note. And so sorry, those are open note. And because we're on this this online format we will be doing it via over zoom i don't use proctorio or the like i really don't need to because i'm really good at detecting whether or not people grabbed code from online like really good um fall semester i submitted over 30 uh academic misconduct reports between all out of 200 students it's not a fun, it was not a fun winter break for me because I had a lot of hearings to attend because students did not understand that I'm really good at, at, let me put this, let me just put it very simply. Pattern detection and pattern matching is a subdomain of computer science. 
I am a computer science professor. That is all that I feel like I need to say about that. So do your best. And I will get into what's acceptable and what's not, okay? I have a very good long list so that will answer those questions. But anyway, uh, how do you turn in your labs and assignments? Um, you submit it online just to basically make sure there's an electronic record. Um, and the second thing to actually get your grade, you have to demo it to me. That means you sit down with me, share your screen, and show me what you're doing. Typically, we'll be in a breakout room, okay? Um, a lot of projects all allow group work so that you, you and your partner can sit down and share the screen together. Um, so, explore, and I, I am very big on having people work together. So please work together. There's a ton of students in this class. It will make your time here, uh, you know, go much easier. But anyway, I'll ask you some questions. Typically, I ask like, what's the most difficult part of this for you and where and where you had your most trouble? Um, I will accept work if it's late. I'm super flexible about that. So, you know, if you need more time, take more time. All right. Um, so in general, my late policy is five points per uh, every day. It's late with a maximum penalty of 50 points. This clause over here where you have two weeks after the due date up to two weeks after the due date to demo it is not really too relevant for this semester. And I tell you every you everybody what I say, which is that um, that this clause over here is so that I can say no to a student who has completely checked out for the entire semester and says, oh, I need to demo everything because I didn't demo a single assignment because I didn't know we needed to demo assignments. And uh, this allows me to say no, okay? Um, given the interesting times we are living in and disruptions that may occur, just I can always waive the late penalty and demoing due date if, you, if there's issues. Um, my exams have a late penalty as well, a very, very lenient late penalty of a 10th of a point per minute. So if you turn in your, uh, your exam an hour late, it's only six points off. So please take your time on the exams. Do not panic about the time on the exams. So academic honesty. All right. I adapted uh, CS50's academic honesty course for our class, which is really very, uh, I think it's very good. Um, my, my philosophy on it is just be reasonable. Um, I want you to interact with your other comment, uh, your other classmates. In fact, I believe the best way to learn something is to actually is to teach it to somebody who doesn't understand it. Um, but you know, there's a thin line. Sorry, there's a there's a kind of a line between you know helping somebody and doing the work for them. So, um, basically, generally speak, the general rule is if you're asking for help, you can show your code to other people. But if you're giving help, you don't so show the solutions to other people. Okay, so um, and if you are sure you, if you think you committed, an, if you know you committed an infraction, like you went to Chegg or something and got the answer, and then you realize, wait, that was a terrible idea. If you let me know within seventy-two hours, I will probably not be too harsh about it. All right. So here is what's reasonable, are reasonable activities you can do. Communicating with classmates about assignment in English or some other written language like Klingon, Elvish, or Esperanto. Um, discussing the course material with others in order to understand it better. Um, helping a classmate identify a bug. If you go, hey, I'm having trouble. I don't know why this is cra crashing. And you shoot off a, and you just, shoot off your screen, a screenshot of your code on Discord. That is awesome, great, right? Sharing your code with others, helping them identify your bug, totally common activity to do. Grabbing a few lines of code online, provided the codes are not themselves solutions to the assigned uh, problems. So basically, um, suppose you wanna basically Here's a common one. 
suppose you want to basically find, you have a problem that you're trying to separate words, right? You're trying to get, given a sentence, give me all the words in the sentence. Okay, well, I need to remove everything that's not a letter, essentially. How do I do that? Okay, so maybe you go online and you find there's a regular expression. Like here's a line of code that does a small part of that, which is removing the punctuation and stuff. Great, you can use that provided because it's not a full solution to the problem, but it helps you and you cite the line's origins. So citing in this class, very simple, no MLA stuff like that, right? All you have to do is just simply comp give me a comment with the URL. Pretty much in every single case, um, and, you know, and if you over, so, and this is not something I want you to be overly like cautious about. As long as you cite it, guess what? It's not plagiarism. Now it may be, it might, now for other professors that might fall in a different line, like the, like, okay, but if you over grab an answer, here's what I'm going to tell you. Okay. That's like everything. Uh, I think you need to sit, go back and do it yourself. That is what I will tell you if you grab an answer and you cite it. Like if you grab everything and you cite it, I will basically say, hey, um, that's good, but I think you missed out on like a, a valuable learning experience trying to do it. So please sit down and try to do it yourself. And I'll give you credit once you do it yourself. It's that simple. So as long as you cite it, we're, we're going to be, we're going to be very good. So sending or showing, but again, only try to go for like, like a few lines, if for like something that solves a small problem. And you'll understand that like when, when like, okay, is there a simple way to add all the, every line to a list? Oh, okay. There's a single function that does that. Okay, great. Sharing a few codes of your own code online. So like dropping something on Stack Overflow, asking, hey, can I have some help? Where's my bug on this? Going to Stack Overflow is fine, so long as it's not for an outright solution to the problem. Make sense? Okay, whiteboarding, putting stuff on the code, you know, on whiteboarding or pseudocode, but not the actual code. I'm working with and even paying a tutor to help you with the course, provided the tutor is not actually doing that for you. So what is not reasonable? Grabbing a solution to some problem and just basically putting your name on it. Asking a student, uh, somebody else. So say Alice says to Bob, hey, Bob, you got this done? And Bob's like, no, nah, I, I, I need your help. Can I see your answer? And Alice is like, sure, that's not okay. You, but, uh, Alice should not share her answers with Bob. Okay, what she should do is say, okay, Bob, well, where are you having trouble? and help him and, and give Bob some pointers. Uh, decompiling, deobfuscating, or disassembling solutions to the problem sets. Uh, not citing your code. Uh, for example, finding code online that addresses a question on an exam. So you go and Google something that would work for a problem on an exam, and then you don't cite it. Yeah, that's not great. Even worse is like when, when students think they find an answer to a question, but it's the answer to the wrong question. And you don't, and just blindly copy and paste it. Mm, not great. Um, paying somebody to solve the problem for you. Uh, just trying to find the some solution to the problem. Um, some of my problems have like multiple parts, like five or six parts saying, so if Alice decides to take you know, problems one through three, and Bob says five, uh, says they'll do four, five, and six, and then they'll combine their answers. Uh, no, you, you should work on them together, all of them. So submitting a few, the work of another person, uh, submitting work, the same or similar work to this course that you've submitted or will submit to another. Um, this is, this is a weird one, but um, basically it's that one's more for my uh, 1051 class where there's a final project 
and I just need, and I need students to get approval before they like double dip on their final project. So do the same final project before uh, for two classes. Um, and then looking at another person's problem set and just changing a couple variables. Okay, when in doubt, ask me. I won't be a jerk about it. I swear to God, you know, I'm, I won't penalize you for asking a question about about this. I will be reasonable about this. Okay. All right. Uh, you have rights. Um, it's actually not not a bad idea to just kind of uh to just glance through this and look at like things that you have rights to. Like you have the right to say, hey, two final exams during a normal, on the same day, sorry, three final exams on the same day during a, during a normal semester is no go. That's a right you have. You have a right to say, professor, I need you to move the uh, final exam because I have two other final exams that day. So, you know, just keep that in mind. Okay, so how does this course work? For the most part, You'll be interacting it through the module class. You can go to start here. It's another way to kind of just go to the very first one. Um, and it's generally, you know, we we created the, I created this during you know the during uh, the COVID kind of lead up, and we've got I've broken it into pages. Here's a welcome to the course. Um, you can hit the next page to go to that. Here you can learn you learn about me and my teaching philosophy and the fact that I'm uh, he, I love playing video games, um and and uh, and I like books so, and I like writing music so. Um, this so but we can also find all of these under the modules page. Um, if you want to know what we're going to be learning in this course, the YouTube Studio Crash Course has this wonderful 10 minute summary of basically everything we're doing in the course. It's like a super high level overview, but it covers a lot of what we're gonna be doing in this course. Um, and, and it's wonderful. Um, I also, in case, you in, because, in case you need to know, I've got videos on how to install uh, um, Java on your computer if you're having trouble with that and how to install IntelliJ, which is the IDE I use. You can use whatever you want for coding. I do not care. Um, or rather, the only thing I care about is, does it work for you? So if you want to use Vim or Emacs, go right ahead. Um, if you want to use Eclipse, great. If you want to use um, NetBeans, sure, go ahead. If you want to use IntelliJ, great. I use that too. So use whatever works for you. Um, and finally, if, you, if this this first kind of day, if you've got the time, if you've got time throughout the semester, take I offer fifteen points of extra credit any time in the semester, no due date, worth fifteen points, um, and assignments are typically a hundred. Uh, so just like fifteen extra points add on top that you can. Uh, that's incentive for you to learn regular expressions because we don't really teach those into like a really advanced course and it's super useful to know them. So um, the way this is uh, split up is basically, um, I'll have an overview. If I have, I might have an overview kind of just like paragraph, but the vast majority of it is in the videos. So these are playlists. I don't publish the entire thing video by video because that's a pain. Instead, this is a video you can, Click on the top left and it will bring you to YouTube and open up the playlist on the right. Or you can directly access the playlist by clicking on the top right and it'll have a bunch of videos. Now these videos, my objective is that they were short. So if we, and they are of a varying quality based on when I recorded them and how far I was in the process. So this one is, but anyway, the point being is that they are screen captures generally of me coding. Uh, and they are generally 10 to 15 minutes long. A week's worth is about to is about uh, is about, you know, you know, a playlist is a well, this one's like an hour long for the playlist. So the first week is like an hour worth of video, but you'll never have more than two hours worth of video for a module. 
In other words, you'll never have more than what you would normally get in a lecture. I'm not one of those professors that gives you four hours of video to watch. Um, this is review. This first week will be review of object-oriented programming um, and the like. And I'm going to go over the homework in a bit. I'm going to, in fact, figure out when the due dates for this are, because obviously it shouldn't be due today. So I have to adjust the due dates a bit. Um, but generally, I've got this, then you'll have a quiz. For the array list, too, for the array list, here you go. The videos for array lists. And you'll see that basically what I do is that I say is that I have an overview video that we produced in uh, in the studio at Temple. We have a, do have a studio. They're actually fairly high quality videos that we, you know, and I'll mute it, where basically we had, where we went through and we, um, and I just to give a high level overview of what we're going to be doing this uh, and the important things for this module. So there's a voice over there that's talking. It's not just simply a static image. Um, so, but basically that's how I split it up. They're all, um, all available on, on YouTube, again, because YouTube is super easy for everybody to, um, to watch. Um, again, the second module is going to be a bit of review, is also a bit of review, but also new stuff. Okay. Um, and I will keep you, and I, my plan is today I should be able to go through and adjust the due dates for the first couple of assignments so that we have an idea here. But just keep in mind that the due dates right now are uh, in flux, so don't get too stressed out about them. All right, other important links before I get started on the homework um, and our activity for the day. All right. Um, so. Um, yeah, I need to remove this because just simply send me, shoot me an email. My email's right here. The Zoom link is right here. Uh, this is our grader, Happy Feet, my dog. Um, she's such a good dog. Um, Discord link. Um, I have a channel basically set, uh, set up for Discord. Uh, feel free to basically collaborate with your students. I know like people like to do WhatsApp and stuff, and I figured I would facilitate the process just by creating a Discord uh, link there. Um, also, um, there's a bunch of other Temple communities on Discord, so it's just useful. Um, you do not have to use it. I'm not going to, you know, it's just simply something I facilitated because there's also a lot of former students that are there. Um, and I figured I'd make it easy for students. Um, a link to the, my YouTube channel. I, I don't need you to like or subscribe anything. I really don't. Um, this, this I, I, I have no plans to monetize any kind of content for this because, again, I'm using YouTube simply because it's a very easy way to distribute it. Um, please just, so if you can't find it, the, what you're looking for, you can go there. Um, and here is... A GitHub with all the with all the code that I've done. So this is all the code I've done for the class. Um, you can find it under destruct for data structures. Um, for the various data structures that I wrote. So in case you're having some issues, you can copy code from there uh, for your data structure if you're trying to recreate it and just see where you went where you made a mistake. Um, Another one last thing over here in the center, it's kind of hard to see or easy to miss, lecture recordings. So over here is where I have lectures and I'll be post, this is where I'll be posting the recordings. And not only that, I have the recordings for all the previous semesters. So if you feel like I didn't answer a question or you wanna get ahead on the lectures and see what's up, you can go to the previous semesters. All right, any questions? Cool. So um, let's see, stop sharing. Great. OK. And again, just, you know, if you need to get up and do something, you can. Um, I'll probably call a break in a bit, but first I want to talk about 
let me go ahead and actually get my, sorry, I'm getting everything kind of just set up here for, um, for the assignment. So because there's a number, there's a couple of headaches that I know can happen just from, uh, from doing it. So let's go ahead and see. So So let me go ahead and I'm going to share my entire screen here. So, which is always a fun prospect. Share screen, entire screen. All right, so here's what we're going to do. We are going to Canvas first. Okay, so we are going to go and grab the first assignment now. Okay, so what I'm going to do is I'm logging in. I am going to Canvas. And this is like the first hiccup, which is just if you haven't used, um, if you haven't used IntelliJ before or haven't imported had to import code into IntelliJ, it can be a bit of a headache. So what we're going to do, I'm going to do this the easiest way possible. So I'm going to click on our class. I'm going to go to our first assignment, module, fox and rabbit. That's our first assignment. So there's two uh, things here. First is a PDF write up which has basically everything I'm about to go over, but in written form, if you need to refer to it later, okay, and you liked having something to look at. And it also has the rubric as well, but it's a fairly easy rubric, okay? Um, so otherwise, I'm gonna download this file. I'm gonna put it on my desktop. This is hunt.zip. Okay, I'm gonna download it. I'm putting it on my desktop so it's easy to find. Let's see, got all these game files on, on my desktop um, because I was installing games and in like yesterday. Big fan of all sorts of games, big fan of Elden Ring, by the way. Um, and as well, I, I enjoy roguelikes. And, but I think the game I've got the most hours logged is Solaris in. So anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and unzip this file. Extract all, right? It works the same way on Mac or on Linux. And this is gonna have a ton of Python, sorry, not a ton of Python files, a ton of Java files in them. Okay, as you can see here, where it, it extracted a folder, it created this folder over here, right? And now what we're doing is that we are looking at this folder. Okay, we are looking at this folder. Um, now over here, now we're done with, with this. So we are going, I'm going to go ahead and move this to the center. Okay. So here, what we're going to do is we are going to, really, is it all just shortcut links? I bet it is. Okay. So what I'm gonna do now in IntelliJ, and it works the same way in Eclipse, if you're using it, is I'm going to uh, create a new project. So select new project, Java. Over here is where you've got basically a JD, where it says, okay, which version of Java do you want to use? SDK, Software Development Kit. Because if you're developing for an older version or some legacy program, you might want to use a different um, Java uh, toolkit, maybe. But whatever. So previous. So sorry, we go next, next. We're just gonna call it rabbit hunt. And I'm going to just simply say, open it up in this window. Okay. And now what I'm gonna do is I'm going to go ahead and go into my settings at the moment. And this is not something you have to do because you're over here trying to read what I've got here and it's super tiny. So we're gonna fix that. Boom, that better for everybody? Okay, everybody can see a bit better hopefully now. I can up it a bit more. So, <laughs> okay, so no need to do that. That is, I just simply changed the UI. Um, so, what, so what we have over here is that we've got our folder, which is located on my computer. 
here it's located in Professor Andrew uh, slash ID projects slash. So it, it will set up automatically for you where it is. Um, and it's got basically this dot idea folder, which is just stuff that's important to IntelliJ. Your Eclipse will have something similar. Don't worry about it. The important thing is this folder, the SRC folder. What we're going to do is that we are going to take all these files. So I just simply did Control A, Command A on a Mac, and I'm going to drag them into SRC. OK? All right. Didn't want to work the first time. Let's see. Didn't want to do that. Why not? So I'm going to just do Control A and Control C for copy. And now I'm going to paste. There we go. And copy them in. So notice that I'm copying them into the SRC directory. If they're not in the SRC directory, it won't work. That's the important thing. See how I open up the SRC folder and all the files are there. If they are outside of the SRC folder, then, then IntelliJ will be like, well, they're not, if they're outside like this, they'll look a bit different. They won't be, they'll look like this. And you won't be able to run them because they're not part of the files that you want to compile. So if you're if they're not there, just like try moving them. I did control X and control V to move them or command X and command V, which is cut. So here, right, they're in in this now and now we can look at them. So all right, we've got three so we've got a bunch of files over here. That's a lot of code. But fortunately, at the end of the day, all you have to worry about is this single function over here. Let's go ahead and go into settings again and adjust. So let me go ahead. And now that I'm done working with the UI, I'm going to just knock that down a notch. And I'm going to go ahead and now for the editor, I'm going to go to the font. I'm going to up that up to maybe. Let's see, 32. Yeah, that looks good. OK, so one thing that you should know is that I am a big, this is a love or hate thing. And I, and I can only spend a couple minutes here because I love talking about fonts. But one thing that you can, first off, use monospace. Um, I'm using something called Fear Code. And it supports something called ligatures, which is a love it or hate it. So notice over here, you've got the not equals okay if i enable ligatures it creates a not equal sign it exploits something in, that's built into fonts like when you have an f and an i next to each other the f will like like in finish the f will slightly overlap the i um i think it makes it e more easier to read for me some people hate it some people Love it. Just so, but if you see a symbol that you can't recreate on your keyboard, it's probably because it's a ligature, which is most likely the not equal. Okay. So, all right. Now it's easier to read. So, the only class we have to really worry about that you, as, your, as the student, only really need to worry about is the rabbit class. And specifically, uh, it is FIRA code. It, it should be built in FIRA code. It is for the defunct Firefox operating system that was meant for phones. But uh, so they commissioned a bunch of font, uh, fonts in that family. Um, so what we've got here is basically this decide move function. And I will explain what it does very shortly. But this is basically where you're going to be working for the rest of the day. Um, the rest of the code is just simply support for this program which is rabbit hunt, uh, and we have a grader. So I'm going to run the grader first. You'll see that it will give me basically a very, it will, it's essentially going to give me a zero. Oh, couldn't it find a class grader. Interesting. Why can't it do that? So cannot find main class, class not found. Is it because I pulled it out and put it back in? Let's go ahead and delete these. Yeah, let's go ahead and delete the, oh, I know what I did. I know what I did wrong. I, I accidentally copied this file over, this IML file into the source code. 
Nope. Okay. It was probably from me. Let's go ahead and undo the move. Undo. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. There we go. Yep. It was from me messing around and just showing you how to move stuff around. So that was going on. So, okay. So the rabbit, uh, so I run this grader and it gives you very useless information right now, but it will make sense. Rabbit escapes two times out of 300 or 0%, grade zero. So this will give you basic, this is the way you can see what you're going to get a grade for on this assignment. Um, and because, the, so, and it runs 300 game, iterations of the game. So let's go ahead and run this actual thing. So we're going to get a GUI. Um, so this is, will appear blank at first. That's just because it, of the way Java works. But we've got a bunch of buttons at the bottom. We've got step, run, stop, reset, replay. So if I hit run, you'll see that we've got these dots moving around a board. So we've got this grid. And we've got a fox, which is the red dot. And it is currently seeking the rabbit, which is the brown dot. When the fox lands on the rabbit, it eats the rabbit. Because that's what foxes do. The fox ate the rabbit. And over here now, we've got the message, the fox eats the rabbit after 30 turns. This bar over here can slow down the game. Or we can speed it up. The fox eats the rabbit after 16 turns, OK? Now, these green dots are bushes. What they do is that they block motion and they block line of sight. The objective of the game is that the rabbit wants to uh, capture the fox. Sorry, the fox wants to capture the rabbit. And then the other objective for the rabbit is that the rabbit will escape if it survives for 100 turns. But as you can see, the, rat, the fox is doing quite a good job at grabbing the rabbit. Oh, he might survive this time. Let's see. Yep, so the rabbit escaped. So why is the rabbit not doing super well at this game? Well, it's because at the end of the day, we've got the, we basically, the way that these, that the fox decides to move is with its decide move function. And it's got all these things that we're going to go into. OK, so I will go over into the, it as to how this works. The rabbit's decide move is essentially choose a random direction and try moving in that direction. Randomness is not good for survival. OK, so your objective is to get the rabbit to survive as much you know, at, at the highest percentage possible. Now, I will let you, now let me tell you, the rabbit, um, it's very, it's there, the only way to get 100% in this program is there, there's not really a legal way to do it. Okay, the only, the, the only winning move, as they say, is not to play the game. That is the only hint I'll give there. But so you can't really get 100%. You can get like a 90% survival rate though, very um, through some, through in about 10 lines of code once you understand how this program works, okay? Which is understanding how the decide move function works. So let's go through the, uh, through the code very briefly. So first up is we are gonna learn a bit about not necessarily how, how to write your own GUI program, but just understanding what some of these classes are in here. We've got model, we've got view, and we've got controller. Got an error here too. Oh no, it's error in the, um, in the documentation. Got it. Okay, so we've got this model here. We will reference this in a bit, but, um, but basically we've got, so we've got this very famous um, kind of way of modeling this program called model view controller. Um, the model is the internal representation of the code. So basically, it's everything that's actually happening, all the game logic. The view is actually looking at the game. 
So the model is all the stuff that basically you can't see, like all the internal variables and the like. The view is this grid. And I should mention that this is not a Pac-Man grid. You don't go out the other side. There are, this is like an enclosed area. If you, bump into a if you bump into a wall, you can't go off the edge. It's, it's a wall, it's literally listed as a wall. So the view is that grid that we can see. And then the controller helps control the view. Specifically, it is this bar over here. It's the, wind it's the frame around this entire window we're seeing. All these buttons and stuff, that is the controller. So the controller and the view, not really something you have to worry about since that's the GUI and that's already uh, the graphical, the GUI, the GUI, the graphical user interface pronounced GUI, okay? Um, so the view and the controller, don't really have to worry about that. So we're not gonna. If you're interested, you can take a look at that. Um, the model has all sorts of, un of interesting things such as the rabbit is alive, the game being over, how many steps have been taken, what is the number of steps that the game is going to go until. Now, I should mention the only thing you're allowed to modify, the only place you're allowed to write code is in the rabbit class. Okay, so keep that in mind. So no modifying this file um, over here to do stuff. So the rabbit is alive. Um, put and then we've got a bunch of useful other things over here that I'll go into as we when we look into the into the into the fox's code. A bunch of static variables, variables that are easy for you to remember. So rather than having to remember that a two represents a rabbit, you can just simply do model dot rabbit. Okay. So and inside uh, now on the uh, in this program we have two things. We have essentially uh, the bush, which is just simply a stub that doesn't do anything. And we have animals, which the fox and the rabbit are, and they have a bunch of fun functions. So let's look, go ahead and look at the fox's code to understand how it works. So the fox extends an animal. That means it is an animal, okay? So private Boolean, have we seen an animal? Sorry, have we seen the fox, the rabbit? Answer is going to be by default, no. We don't have any, the fox says, I don't have any information about it. Can I see the rabbit now? Nope. And then have I seen, what's my distance and what's my direction in the current direction? Now, one thing to remember about the, to, one important thing to note about the game is that it is a turn-based game. The fox moves, then the rabbit moves. The fox moves, then the rabbit moves. The fox moves, then the rabbit moves. So, uh, so basically they, um, if the fox, so if the rabbit moves into the range of the fox, the fox doesn't see it until his turn. All right, here's a constructor. And all the constructor does is that it sets a random direction for the fox to start pacing it because that's how the fox will work. It's gonna start pacing. So here's where the magic happens. Decide move controls the movement of the fox. It returns the direction in which the fox wishes to move. So the way decide move works. Okay, the first thing it does is this for loop block over here, which as you can see in the comments, comments are great by the way, that all it's gonna do here is look around for the rabbit. Okay, so it says can see rabbit now is equal to false. Okay, can't see the first thing is that I'm going to assume I can't see the rabbit until I until proven otherwise. And then we create this for loop. For model dot min direction. So the directions north, there are eight directions. There are the eight directions, the compass directions, north, <coughs> south, east, west, and then those, comp, uh, you know, then you've got northeast, northwest, sorry, you've got northeast, south, east. <coughs> oh, I'm sorry southwest and northwest. So four into i model dot min direction. I, so this starts at north and then the numbers go up counterclockwise. So if we note to seven, and if we notice we've got north is zero, northeast is one, east is two, southeast is three, south is four. So it's going like this, north, northeast, 
east, southeast, south. So it's just going around in a clock direction. Do you have to remember what those are? No, you've got model to do that for you. And what it's going to do is that in this code, it basically gives you the minimum direction and the max direction. So for i is equal to zero, i is less than model dot min direction. I'm sorry, i is less than model max direction. Basically iterate, let i be each of the directions. And what it does is then it then calls the look function, which is built into animal, which calls it for the model. What does the look function does do? Um, it, well, here's what the comment says. Finds the first visible thing in a given direction, starting from the animal's current position. So if I run this code again, and instead of hitting run, I'm going to hit step. You saw that how it was shooting out these little laser eye, uh, you know, this the, basically this kind of beam. That's representing its look function. So it's kind of showing you where it's looking, which is as looking in a straight line. And what the code does is that it gives it, so here it should see it. So it, see, it says, hey, um, tell me what's in this direction. What it, because the, it will tell you the first thing the beam hits, which is wall, wall, bush. So if we can see over here, right? It went to a wall, went to a wall, bush, another wall, whatever. And then, rabbit. Okay, mouse. Sorry, just take some uh, manipulation sometimes to get that. So it's so, so basically what it says is that if I look in, the, in a direction and what I see, am, and there's a bunch of things I can see. Well, I say a bunch, but there's four things, an edge, a fox, a rabbit, or a bush. OK. It says, hey, if I see the rabbit, then set it to being true. Set have seen rabbit and can see rabbit now to true. Note the distance, the direction I uh, to the rabbit and the distance to the rabbit. Great. Now, if I have seen the rabbit recently, move towards its last known position. So if have seen rabbit is true, if I have seen the rabbit, not can I see it now, but have I seen it? Have I seen it just as a result of seeing it now, which was part of the for loop? Or have I seen it in the past because I might not be able to see it now at the moment? What I do is I say, hey, if my distance to the, rat, to the last known position of the rabbit is greater than zero, I'm gonna keep. I'm gonna move towards it, and the way you move towards something, uh, move in a direction, is you return the direction you want to go in. So here, it said, "Hey, the direction I'm looking to in, that's the direction to the rabbit. I'm gonna head in that direction." But if I lose track of the rabbit by getting to the last known location of the rabbit, I say, "Hey, last known location is false," and then I set choose a random direction. Don't return it though, because if I haven't seen the rabbit. So because the code is, if I've seen the rabbit, go toward, toward the rabbit. Otherwise, what he's going to do, if I haven't seen the rabbit or I lost track of it, I'm going to basically pace. OK? Now, here's a function that's important, can move. If I can move in the current direction, so that's the direction that just got kind of chosen at random at the beginning. If I can move in the current direction, I move in that direction. But if I can't, I use this really important function here, model.turn. If I can move in model.turn, I do so. So what is model.turn? Model.turn is, is what makes our code a lot easier. Uh, because without it, essentially what you'd have to be doing is going, OK, if the, as the rabbit, you'd be going, OK, if the fox is to the north, so if the fox is in this direction, then maybe I should try going this direction or this direction, right? But then if the fox, and so then if the fox is to the northeast, maybe I should try going this direction or this direction. 
So uh, you'd basically have to write, write eight blocks of code, which is not fun. Model.turn removes that. It basically turns everything into relative directions. So basically what model.turn is, is that it gives in a direction and a number of times to make it uh, a, a eighth turn, an eighth of a turn clockwise, a 45 degree turn, return the resultant direction. So what does that mean? Well, basically he's saying, hey, the fox is saying, okay, I'm sorry, got to get the pen again. The fox is saying, okay, I want to try going in this direction. If I can't, I'm going to try going in this direction first. Model.turn, current direction one, which is a 45 degree turn, okay? And if I can't go in that direction, I'm going to try doing a 45 degree turn in the other way. Make sense? Which is up. because there might be a bush here and the fox might be trying to get around it. Now, if, it can, if I can't move forward and make any progress in that direction, then I just choose a random direction and try to go in that direction. And if for some reason I have been stuck, I'm just going to stay put. So the rabbit, as we've discussed previously, um, just simply chooses that direction at random. Finally, the last two functions. Uh, rabbit hunt creates the model view and controller, sets those up, and then launches the game. Grader does the same thing, but it runs the game without launching the GUI 300 times. Because that, so you'll want rabbit hunt for testing to see what's going on. And Grader also helps you test by seeing what your survival rate is. So the way the grader works is a square root curve, okay? Which is which is as follows: I take your, I take your survival rate, okay? Grab the square root of it and multiply by ten. So in other words, a eighty percent, an eighty-one percent survival rate would give you a ninety, because the square root of eighty-one is nine, multiply by 10, you get a 90. And the reason for this is that it gives you diminishing returns. So once you get basically a 90% survival rate, it's very hard to improve your grade. But the good thing is, is that it's not too difficult to get a 90% survival rate once you understand the program. So you'll be working in the rabbit function, in the rabbit code. Now, your first thing might be basically tempted to do is just copy this code, all of this code and use this and make your rabbit work like that. I, I suggest that you only copy one bit of the code from the, uh, from, from Fox. And that is specifically the for loop and the if statement, but none of the stuff inside of it. And then changing if you see it to a Fox, right? Because you're looking for the Fox. So I have, so because other, because I've got basically uh, three hint, hints for you, okay, to help you get started. Okay, the first hint is that, is that basically that most of the Fox code is not something the rabbit needs, okay? Um, and that ties in directly to the second hint, which is that the rabbit is a prey animal. It should conserve its energy as much as possible, so to speak. So its default behavior should be to stay put, model.stay. Now, why is this? The reason is, is that the turns are, ace, that we have asynchronous turns. And now the Vox has to do all the work to find the rabbit, which it will do. But what's important to understand here 
is now it's moved and it's the rabbit's turn right now. Okay. And the fox will see the rabbit on his turn, but he hasn't seen it yet because he just moved into this square. The rat, the fox just lit literally just moved here. Much need a much thicker line. The fox literally just moved here. So he just moved here. So the rabbit has a chance to react. If he looks around and he sees, he will have a chance to react and he could possibly move out of the line of sight before the rabbit fox could even see him. Okay. Um, so basically my third kind of idea here is that is that basically my third hint to you is that there's two good strategies for the fox to, for the rabbit to do. The first is much is the more difficult of the strategies, but it's fun to try. Um, and it, for those of you familiar with MMORPGs, it is the kiting strategy. Uh, K I T E kite, and that in in MMORPGs, typically what the kiting strategy involves is that e, is that one player basically makes basically says to a monster to a big tough monster, look at me, look at me, focus on me, eat me, um, and runs and runs away and has the monster chase him. And a monster does all of his attention on one guy while the enemy while while trying to chase him, while everyone hits him with damage over time effects to try to run out the clock on the monster, so to speak. So a kiting strategy in this case would be get the rab fox to look at the rabbit and then get the fox maybe to in an infinite loop. Like one infinite loop is go around the bushes. Like if you get a bush like this, you can just continuously circle the bush and run out the clock if the rabbit, if the fox is deliberately chasing you because you and the fox are moving at the same speed. Okay. The second uh, thing that I find more useful is to exploit the fox's line of sight. Let's go ahead and reset this so that maybe the fox will be in a better position. All right, yes, that's a great position for the fox to be in. So the fox's line of sight is as follows, right? It's this, let me draw lines. It's this line. So this is the fox's line of sight. And you'll notice that we've got some massive gaps here in the line of sight, okay? Like really huge, right? This entire area over here are the, you know, between the, between the lines, are these just giant blind spots, right? Because you can only, because everybody can only look in straight lines. So combining that, what we, we know with the turns being asynchronous is that basically, if you get the fox to move in, if you get the fox to move here, Okay, the rabbit then gets a turn. If the, ra the fox won't see the rabbit, but the rabbit gets a turn and it can see the fox. And then the rabbit can then decide to move basically out of the line of sight. Like he, and like here, 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 or here, all of those directions would move out of the line of sight. Make sense? And so then the rabbit would never see it. That strategy, when done correctly, can get a 90% survival rate. Now, and the order in which you do the directions does matter, even symmetrical directions. Okay, so what should you do? So I'm going to call a break in a bit, um, but to let you di let this digest, then I'm going to call a break, 
He said, after we call break, I'll set you up into breakout rooms and I'll go around the rooms to get you started on this. But what should your first step be? Your first step should be, okay, change this to staying put. And then create, uh, the second thing is create a loop to look for the fox. The third thing is to then, if I see the fox, write an if statement, if I see the fox, move directly away from the fox. That's not going to be a good survival strategy, but it will make your fo your rabbit very reactive and give you the base of for the code, uh, a basis for your code to continue with. Make sense? So that's because then you have your fo you have your rabbit just you have a default action, you have your rabbit taking action and then sensing the environment around him. And then you also have him being reactive to the environment around him. And once you have that, you have the ability to start trying to win. So let's say, so why don't we go ahead and take a break for about say 10 minutes, get a good chance to stretch our legs. And then I will come back and I will split us into breakout rooms. Does that sound good to everybody? Any questions before we before I go and split up into us in, up into breaks? Uh, yeah, I got a quick one. Yeah, it's about cool. formatting. Yes. Um, did, are you picky about like Pascal case versus Camel case and like where the brackets are and everything? The only thing I'm picky about is whether you're consistent. That's all I care about. Okay. Consistency is way more important than than a uh, style. It's much more important that you use your st the style that works for you. Just be consistent with the code you write. Okay, thank you. No worries. It's a good question. Um, all right, so why I'm gonna stop the recording. We'll take a 10 minute break. Um, I'll keep Zoom up. And so I'll be back at around, let's say 9.56. And um, while we're coding, by the way, if you need to take a break, anything, just go ahead and let me know you're going AFK. And that way I'll know that you're AFK so I won't call on you or, or ask you if you need anything. Okay.